After attending UCLA, writer-director John LaFia was dabbling in the experimental music scene in Los Angeles in the early 1980s. After this, he shifted his attention towards movies. While getting his start, as many did, working on Roger Corman films, he quickly moved on to write and direct his first feature, The Blue Iguana, starring Dean Stockwell, Pamela Gidley, Flea, and Dylan McDermott in his first leading role. The director also produced the soundtrack, which contained the theme song by the famous rapper Curtis Blow. Moving on from there, he helped to co-write the screenplay for the horror film Child's Play with Don Mancini and Tom Holland. He came up with the name Chucky for the doll and was credited as the one who came up with the now famous line, Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? Child's Play was released on November 11th, 1988 and was number one at the box office. It ended up pulling in over $44 million worldwide. Seeing the franchise potential, the studio wanted to get a sequel out quickly, so Don Mancini wrote the screenplay for Child's Play 2, and Lafia took over the helm to direct. Lafia wanted to make a different kind of monster film and approached New Line Cinema with an idea. He wanted to make a film that was about something we as humans hold dear. Dogs. Although he didn't want it to be about a normal dog gone crazy like Cujo, his idea was more a mixture of the Terminator and Frankenstein in dog form. He sold the idea as Jaws with Paws. Lafia's original treatment for the film called for all sorts of expensive computer effects, and they estimated the budget would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 million. This was a bit more than New Line was looking to spend, so the director started working on some rewrites. While this was going on, he brought in visual effects master Kevin Yeager to do the effects. Lafia worked with Yeager on the Child's Play movies and wanted his expertise here. Yeager was well-versed in creating animatronic dogs. He previously made them for 1990's Meet the Applegates and 1991's The Borrower. They were discussing what type of dog would be right for the movie. German Shepherds, Great Danes, and Doberman Pinschers had all been used in other movies, and they needed something that would stand out. They needed a dog that was expressive and friendly looking, but also could be big and intimidating. After searching through loads of books on canines, they agreed on a Tibetan Mastiff. Tibetan Mastiffs are some of the largest canines in the world, growing over 26 inches tall and weighing between 100 and 200 pounds. Tibetan Mastiffs are friendly, loyal, but very territorial and defensive around strangers. That's why the Tibetan monks use them as guard dogs for their monasteries. While the dogs had the right look, they discovered the reason why they hadn't been used in films before. They were difficult to train. Still, they knew this was the breed they needed for the film and decided to move forward. Jaeger was happy with the breed because they were covered in thick, dark fur. This would make it easier to create believable puppets and animatronics since the fur would help to conceal the wires. Keeping with the original Terminator theme, there was going to be what Jaeger called the third stage transformation. The dog was getting doses of an experimental drug, which made him bigger and stronger as he went through each transformation. His teeth grew longer, his muscles grew bigger, and he was starting to look more like a wolf than a dog. Later in the script, the animal set on fire, which burns most of its fur off. At this stage, it was meant to be a big payoff, like the ending of The Terminator or The Fly. This was going to be the big showstopper, the thing that everyone who saw this movie talked about. That is, until the studio said no. The price was going up, and this would have cost more than they were willing to spend. Plus, as the director was retooling the script, he was thinking the story should make the dog a more sympathetic monster. He wanted the audience to root for the dog, so he made him a combination of Quasimodo, King Kong, and most importantly, Frankenstein's monster. Lafia continued working on the script, and after a year of rewrites, he had it finely tuned to be a much more reasonable monster movie. It was about a journalist who's investigating an animal lab called Emax, and while there, she rescues this giant, seemingly friendly dog named Max. Unbeknownst to her, Max is an experimental hybrid created in a lab built to be the ultimate guard dog. The problem is, Max is still experimental and will kill anyone if he's feeling threatened. The director also had a wicked sense of humor, so he wrote the script with a nice dose of dark comedy to add to the horror. When working on the script, he included all sorts of things that real dogs would do. Chase a mailman, pee on a fire hydrant, or bury something in the yard. He flipped all those on their heads by having the dog kill the mailman, peeing acid, and burying a body in the yard. The studio was happier with the rewrites because it brought the budget down to a much more manageable $6 million. They looked into casting and hired Ali Sheedy. Sheedy was known to be a member of the Brat Pack, a group of young actors who frequently appeared in coming-of-age movies together, like The Breakfast Club and St. Almost Fire. She liked the idea that this was more of a horror thriller and definitely was outside of her usual comfort zone. 
one of the filmmakers approached actor Lance Henriksen to be in the movie. He told the actor about the film and that he wanted him to play the meanest scumbag who ever lived. This immediately turned him off. He said, you've got the wrong man. Henriksen's known for playing a variety of villains, but for him, his character needs more motivation than be evil. Also, he won't play child molesters or men who beat women. He also said he won't do slasher movies. Although he did star in the horror show, which wasn't initially supposed to be a slasher, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, he said he'd only play a bad guy if it was a character with a purpose. Since Max was created with Frankenstein's monster in mind, they made Henriksen's character of Dr. Jarrett more like Dr. Frankenstein. He was a driven man and was doing all these bad things with good intentions. After the brutal murder of his family, Dr. Jarrett sinks everything he has into developing the ultimate guard dog, a DNA-engineered watchdog designed to be a loving pet and ruthless family defender. Henriksen liked the role and signed on. For the additional cast, they hired character actors like Fred Laney, Robert Costanzo, and John Cassini. For a smaller role in the film, Lafia hired William Sanderson because he was in one of his all-time favorite movies, Blade Runner. For Max, they had five dogs, one hero dog that would be on camera the most, and four others, each one that did something specific. The female doubles they had, for example, were more aggressive. Jaeger and his team made 15 dog bodies and 12 dog heads for the normal and second stage burn face versions. Six of the heads were fully radio controlled so they could snarl and make various expressions. They started filming in January of 1983 in locations around California. The opening of the film is all historical pictures of dogs throughout history. They wanted to showcase the animal's relationship with humans over the years, how they can be loyal, friendly, as well as trained to be cruel. The setup was inspired by something that was making news headlines at the time, with PETA raiding animal laboratories. For the first half hour of the film, the director wanted it to be a cheerful movie. Lori rescues Max, and him running to the car was like a heroic dog movie, intentionally looking like something you might see in a Disney film. Max rescues Lori from a mugger, is super affectionate, and acts like a normal dog. They even threw in little dog tricks, like having him bring Lori the towel and then look away when she's getting out of the shower. When we learn more about Max, we see he is the furthest thing from your average dog. Enhanced sight, hearing, strength, speed, stamina, the ability to climb with jaguar-like agility. Even a chameleon-like capability to camouflage itself if threatened. Then after that first act, things start to get dark. He wanted to find the balance of taking a Disney-esque dog adventure that gradually turns into a horror film. The dog almost mauls the paperboy, for example. This was inspired by something that happened when the director was young. He was a paperboy who was frequently chased by dogs. One time, in particular, terrified him. The exterior of the lab was the Sun Valley Water and Power Complex in Sun Valley, California. The interior halls were on location, but the lab rooms were all sets. They got permission to film there, but only at night so they wouldn't interrupt their workers. The neighborhood scenes were filmed in Sierra Madre, California. Part of the way into the film, Lori is having a discussion with her boyfriend Perry. This was taken directly from Lafia's own life. His wife was constantly bringing home stray dogs, so he was having to negotiate with her where they would stay. The scene where Max chases the cat was difficult to shoot because of all the people involved. The animal trainers had to hide behind bushes and trash cans so they wouldn't be seen on film. In reality, the dog wasn't chasing the cat. Both animals were running towards their trainer. To give the illusion of the dog climbing the tree, they had a prop tree turned on its side. They adjusted the camera, and they had the dog shimmy up it like it was climbing. Kevin Yeager's team developed the dog claws and the puppet dog eating the puppet cat. Lafia said this scene got the most laughs and the most boos from the audience. The scene also increased the tension. It showed Max wasn't this big lovable dog and that anything was possible. Another scene with more dark comedy was when Max cornered the neighbor's collie. It's played as funny with the song Puppy Love, but really awful if you think about it since it's pretty much intentional dog rape. The scene in the beginning where the girl's being dragged away by the threat off screen was an homage to Jaws. Bob Shea, the president of New Line, has a cameo as the mechanic. Max urinating acid on a Perry was an homage to Alien. When Max attacks the mailman, the use of slow-mo was an homage to Brian De Palma. Towards the end of the second act, we see the film get even darker. Lafia implements the tonal shift when Max kills the mailman, with the dog acting like a serial killer. Also, most of the movie took place during the day, but they ramped up the horror by having the finale take place at night. 
Since they altered the film so Max wouldn't turn into the canine Terminator at the end, they still needed something to show that he was no longer the lovable pooch that everyone was rooting for. Instead of having the dog get a full body burn, they just had his face get burned, which was different enough and made him look much more menacing. This was the evolution from pet to monster. Another reason they removed the whole sequence where Max becomes a beast was because with the new ending, they wanted the audience to go back to sympathizing with him. Max wasn't evil. He was just a product of these twisted experiments. Lafia felt that it was important that the goodness or dogness of Max come through in the end, instead of the elements that were put in there by man to corrupt him. Max was good. Dr. Jarrett was evil. In the end, Lori isn't afraid, and Max remembers she's the only one who showed him compassion. He gives up his life to save her. They finished filming, and after editing, they held test screenings. Overall, it was positive, but the audience thought there should be more comedy. The producers came back to Lafia and insisted he put more humor into the film. He wasn't sure what to do, so he came up with the idea of filming some new scenes with a pair of dog catchers from Animal Control. He figured these were characters he would be able to insert into the film that have no bearing on the film itself. They're simply comedic relief. They also don't interact with any of the other characters, so their scenes would be easy to work into the film. The studio wanted a little more flash, so they requested two scenes. One where the dog was using his camouflage, and another where he jumps over a police car. The camo scene was done with very early morphing technology, and the dog jump in the car was a composite blue screen with some digital enhancements. Since the technology just wasn't there at the time, both scenes don't look very good. The director wasn't happy with either of them, but it was what the studio wanted, so he added them in. He said they just didn't have the budget or the technology to pull them off properly. They said about 85% of the film was with real dogs, and the other 15% was from the FX team. Scenes that were important to the film, but not possible to do safely with a real dog. The bit at the end where we see the neighbor's dog had a litter of puppies, and one looks like Max, was put in there just as a gag. The director never intended on doing a sequel. It was just a joke he thought was funny. Although New Line was ending their Nightmare on Elm Street series with what would become Wes Craven's New Nightmare in 1994. The executives at the studio were thinking that if Man's Best Friend was a hit, the character would be their new franchise frontrunner. The movie opened on November 19, 1993 and landed in fifth place. It went on to gross $12.9 million domestically. It sadly wasn't the hit they were hoping for. Critics trashed the film, calling it cynical and shallow. It did okay on home video, but faded into obscurity. In the 1995 film Friday, which was also from New Line, they used footage from Man's Best Friend in a scene where John Witherspoon's watching TV. It's your ass, Mr. Postman. Lafia followed this movie up by directing the full motion video game Corpse Killer in 1994. Corpse Killer got a remaster a few years ago, and with the newly restored footage, it looks as good as it'll ever get. It's actually a fun little full motion video game if you're into those sorts of things, which I am. After this, Lafia directed an interactive film called Bombmeister, about a clown played by Jeffrey Jones that's hiding in a house rigged with traps and explosives. Part of me thinks this somehow inspired Saw. He did this with a company called Interfilm. They installed complex electronical projection systems in theaters that would allow the audience to choose which plotline to follow. Sadly, the company was ahead of its time and went bankrupt before the film's release. It was later supposed to be released on DVD, but it never surfaced. Although there was a trailer that was released on one of Interfilm's DVDs. They did have two movies that were released in the theaters, Mr. Payback and Ride for Your Life, but neither made enough money for the company to stay in business. Lafia continued directing with episodes of Babylon 5 and two very successful TV miniseries, 10.5 and 10.5 Apocalypse. Sadly, in April of this year, 2020, John Lafia took his own life. No details were released on why he did it, and I'm not going to speculate. He was 63. Man's Best Friend is a very solid, dark comedy horror. Max is a beautiful dog, well, multiple dogs, and they did a great job of making him a sympathetic villain you really do feel bad for the animal, and in the end, I was rooting more for Max than the humans, which was what the director wanted. Kevin Yeager's animatronics were astounding, as usual, and there really was only once where I was thinking the practicals looked obvious. The CG, on the other hand, just wasn't ready yet. Not the fault of the artists, the technology wasn't anywhere near where it is now. Although, to be fair, 
look at the max jump versus the boomer jump in Independence Day. This was from a film that cost $6 million in 1993, and this was from a film that cost $75 million in 1996. I'm both happy and sad that we never got the full Terminator dog that Jaeger designed. Part of me thinks it would have been awesome, but another part of me knows it would have changed the whole dynamic of the film. If they went full mutated killer dog at the end, there would have been no sympathy for it, and it would have died a monster instead of a hero. I like that it wasn't just cut and dry. Instead of it being this mutant killer dog, it showed Max was just a dog who had no control over what was done to it. Even Dr. Jarrett wasn't 100% evil. He was doing something bad in the hopes of achieving something good, something that would have been beneficial to mankind. Also, Lance Henriksen is outstanding, as always, in the role. We're not talking about man's best friend here. It's a shame about the director. I've seen many of his films, and the guy really had a talent both as a writer and a director. I would have loved to have seen more from him. Man's Best Friend is a different kind of monster movie. I think Lafia handled the balance of comedy and horror perfectly. The addition of the dog catchers didn't really add anything to the film, but the scenes are short, and they didn't really detract from the film either. The two CG shots are dated, but they're incredibly brief, and again, not enough to damage an already good movie. If you've ever wondered what a movie would be like with the most huggable monster ever, you should check this out. Good dog. To everyone watching this, including the trolls, there's someone out there who cares. You aren't alone. If you're depressed and you feel you can't make it another day, please get help. Life is worth living. I promise.